We've studied uh, several systems now quantum mechanically and we found some pretty strange behavior. For example, in tunneling we found that particles which don't have enough energy to get over a barrier nonetheless can tunnel right through the barrier and appear on the other side. So what is it? Why don't we see such strange behavior uh, when we do um, measurements of everyday things using macroscopic uh, equipment and so on? Well, uh, in order to explain that, that what you see macroscopically uh, is not what you see quantum mechanically, what, you, what um, people who develop quantum mechanics stated was the correspondence principle. So clearly, uh, you can't just abandon all the measurements you make with macroscopic objects. So therefore, this strange quantum behavior has to go away when you uh, approach uh, the macroscopic limit. Another way to say that is as the quantum number approaches infinity, predictions from quantum mechanics approach those from classical physics. All right. Well, just let's see what that means in respect to, say, the particle in a box. Recall particle in a box? We're using that actually for a lot of different things. We have the potential on either side of the box going to infinity. And then we have a particle that gets constrained to this box. We found that um, the wave function for this box, uh, for this particle, for example, for the n equal 1, looks something like that. Uh, for the n equal 2, it looks something like this. And so on. Let's look at the probability uh, density. In other words, let's look at the square of the wave function. I'll look over here. Well, we, if we square the n equal 1, we'll get something like this. If we square the n equal 2, this will become positive. So we'll get something like this. This is the n equal 1. This is the n equal 2. All right, so this is probability distribution for low values of the quantum number, n equal 1 and n equal 2. That's the probability density. Classically, classically meaning if we measure this macroscopically, we would expect that the probability of finding the particle somewhere inside this box would be equal all the way across. You know, it's equally probable that you find it here or here or here. Yet quantum mechanically for low quantum numbers, you find the probability is not constant as you go across the box. It varies. And in fact, there are some regions in space where the probability is actually zero. You're guaranteed not to find the particle there. So how does one go from uh, this strange quantum behavior about probability distribution to what you actually see classically for macroscopic objects? And that is uh, so-called the correspondence principle that quantum mechanics for low quantum numbers has to approach classical mechanics for high quantum numbers. So just let's see if that's the case. So here's a low quantum number, n equal 1, n equal 2, two and so on. Let's make uh, n equal a pretty large number. So n equal 1, n equal 2. Uh, let's make it, uh, you know, like that. So now we're going up and down. You can tell, tell what the quantum number is for n equal 2. There's one node. So count the number of nodes here and add 1, and that's the quantum number. And let's now, we increase the quantum number here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and say this is n equal 20, <laughs> approximately. Now let's approach uh, n goes to infinity. So now our wave function goes up and down an infinite number of times before it goes to the other side. Let's now look at probability uh, distributions here for those low quantum numbers of something like this, something like this. Um, yes, my pen seems to screw it up here. There we go, something like that. n equal 1, n equal 2. Now let's go to n equal 20, probability distribution. This is a probability density, so I'll say psi squared. Now what you have is 
5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 16, 18, 19, 19, 20. So all these negative things have been flipped out here to positive for n equal 20. And now let's go to uh, n goes to infinity. Now we have an infinite number of spikes here, infinite number of spikes and so on. So this is very large um, values of quantum numbers, so just sort of be all filled in here. And then classically, what we find is that the probability density is constant. So what we want is this quantum mechanical uh, prediction at very high values of quantum number to be this constant value. Well, we're almost there. Uh, now what you have to do is to uh, realize that um, when you're actually measuring things, if you want to, say, measure uh, high frequency wavelengths, uh, high frequency waves, which means very short wavelengths, you need a device that will be able to distinguish those short wavelengths. And typically in a device where very hot, where you have very short, short wavelengths, you're going to have some sort of averaging mechanism that you can't distinguish individual uh, up and downs, but in fact your measurement device measures some of it. So, uh, you know, measures an average across, but doesn't measure the individual waves. So now if we put a measurement device here, and this is what you're going to measure, because as n goes to infinity, you can't measure infinitesimal waves. You're going to measure some sort of average. What you're going to do is average these, and average these, and average these. And so because of your measurement device, if you look now at the probability distribution, you're going to have so an average there. So the average there, measure over here, average there and average there, you're going to have some sort of flat distribution here because of your measuring device. So indeed, there is a correspondence between uh, classical measurements of probability distribution across the box and quantum mechanical uh, predictions or distribution across the box, taking into the fact that you cannot measure infinitesimal differences in wavelengths. All right, so there's an example of the correspondence principle. In general, if you have a theory that works well in explaining some data, and then you have some data that the uh, experiment doesn't work well, um, then you develop a new theory. In the limit, the new theory, in the limit of the old theory, the new theory has to predict the same thing the old theory did, because that was the measurement. That's also a more general statement of the correspondence principle. If you have an old theory that seems to explain things, your new theory has to, in the limit of where you use the old theory, has to explain that. Like the special theory of relativity, uh, if for uh, very large masses and, and small velocities, you have to have um, Newton's second law of classical mechanics hold. But for very high velocities, then you have to use relativistic. So the velocity is similar to the quantum number here high quantum number, uh, you um, have to reproduce the classical. For Einstein's theory of relativity, for slow velocities, you have to reproduce uh, classical Newtonian mechanics. High velocities, then you need relativity. All right, that's the correspondence principle.